Luke chapter 15. I'll start by reading the whole chapter. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees, scribes, murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise shall that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house? And seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said unto his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him unto his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants." So he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. They began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he received, he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore his father, therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, and I that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Here in Luke chapter 15, a famous parable of the... Uh, well, it's not even a parable, actually. It says very clearly, a certain man had two sons. The parables come before that, but I think some of us or many of us are familiar with that here. In verse 1, you find that, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now, if you would, you can just look a few pages back in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> And in verse 38 it reads, Now it came to pass as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. 
And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. What was her good part? That she sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. Sure, there was much busyness going on in the life of Martha, but that was not the good part that ought to be chosen. We see that same attitude back in Luke chapter 15, where the older brother looks at the younger and says, you know, Father, Father, and, and, and condemns him for such things. But that good part was chosen in that context. And there's so much you can pull out of this chapter. But Luke chapter 15 specifically refers to these publicans and these sinners coming near to hear him. And Jesus gives gives confirmation that that's the good part. Draw near unto him and hear him. That's more important than being busy. That's more important than laboring much to serve Christ. Hearing Christ is by far the more important matter. Verse 2 says, And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And so here we have the contrast made where the publicans and sinners, you know, the 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 unclean, the, the, the raggedy, the dirty people of society, the, 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 the publicans and, and the sinners are hearing the word of God and these religious folks that are clean and proper and, 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 and have done the right thing, they're murmuring, saying of Christ that he receives sinners as if that's some sort of fault. They came to murmur, a soft speaking from afar. Biblically, we often see this as a group that is contrary and complaining. They're removed, and yet their influence through their, their soft murmuring and muttering is heavy, and it's real. So the murmuring is infectious. The murmuring is like a fire. Once it starts, it, it spreads throughout all. And so these Pharisees were known for this, being way back in the crowd, whispering and murmuring about, saying, Of Christ, he receiveth sinners and eateth with them accusing essentially Jesus of being a sinner himself. He received a sinner as if that's some sort of fault of Christ. The Bible says, I am not come to call the sinners to repentance, or I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, the Apostle Paul recorded. He said, of whom I am chief. Sing it o'er and o'er again, Christ receive a sinful man. Make the message clear and plain, Christ receive a sinful man. It's his whole purpose. It was the whole goal of Christ even coming to this world was to save sinners. It was the plan of the Father. He sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Amen. Bottom line, these religious, liberal, legalistic Pharisees we're upset at Christ for fulfilling the will of the Father, fulfilling his whole duty, his whole purpose. We ought to expect the same thing from the religious folks these days, that they would be faulting you and blaming you when you're simply doing the will of God in this world, in this life. They came at Christ, and I believe they'll even come at us in that same fashion. Publicans and sinners drew near to hear, and many were being saved. The Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, He received sin first, and sinners, and many of them died in unbelief. So now we see that that's that good part. We see that Martha, in her example of working about and doing all sorts of good works, would, would by type stand before God and say, Lord, Lord, have we not? Lord, Lord, have I not? Lord, Lord, have I not done many wonderful works? And he'll say, Depart from me, I never knew you. The good part goes to the sinner who humbly comes to Christ and at his feet receiveth the word of God. Here's him. And Christ gives these examples, and he leads into what he's about to explain to the group of publicans and sinners. I believe they're believers that are hearing the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you hear enough word of God, you're eventually going to receive salvation. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners. So he's talking to a mixed group here, and he gives these parables. Immediately he leans into these, and he says, and he spake a parable unto them, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? 
And down in verse 6 it says, And when he cometh home, he calls together all his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. There's a rejoicing that happens when something that is lost is found. And yet it's the Pharisees that faulted Christ for seeking after that which is lost and finding it, giving it what it needed. Jesus says there in verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than ninety and nine just persons which need not repentance. Amen. Is there anyone that needs not repentance? No, Christ is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What he's saying is that the ninety and nine which need no repentance, it's because they have admitted to themselves or believed to themselves, I don't need repentance. Okay? That's what we see so often through that. I don't need to believe that. I reject that. I can do this on my own. They need no repentance. In other words, I don't need the gospel is what these are saying. Right? Yet heaven rejoices. Shouts of joy go up over one sinner that admits that they need to repent. They need to believe the gospel. They need to, they need to change from unbelief to belief. And I believe this by extension is not just referring to salvation. Primarily, actually, I believe that it's wayfaring believers. Because quite often when we're backslidden, right, we don't need no repentance. I got this figured out. I'm walking right. I think I'm doing the right thing, right? But the rejoicing will happen when that one sinner, as a believer, admits that they need repentance, comes back into the fold, was lost, and then is found. And we can see that as, as it plays out in the scriptures that are ahead. Now it continues on and it says, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, verse 10, Likewise, I say unto you, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. When they repent unto life, believe and trust in Jesus for salvation, but also the wayfaring Christian that believes on, on the forgiveness of God comes back and is, was lost and then now is found in their Christian walk. Anyways, rejoice together. We found that was lost. We found what was lost. Wonderful heavenly thought here is to think about one sinner repenting and the celebration that happens. The rejoicing that happens among the angels of God. These joyous angels which have nothing to worry about or be concerned about. There's no, there's no sadness in heaven and they're rejoicing all the more at the thought of one sinner repenting. Now we see some key points here that you can go and apply to what's to come. We see one that is lost and then was found. We see one that was faulted for doing right and that was Christ, right? We see one that was angry and bitter and then, and, then, uh, and then eventually wanted none of these things. So there's so many ways, again, that you can pull this out. Now, go to verse 11, and it says, And he said, so he's in the same context, dealing with the same teaching to these. Before it was a parable, now it says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. So this is a certain man. This is an actual man. Yeah. Was living, breathing, walking, talking. At that day or in the recent history, this event happened. Now some say that this is an example of, and this, this came to my mind with the, uh, the Pentecostal age. She wanted to use this as, as some sort of example of the, the Christian that believed but then sinned and he had to come back and believe and then when he sinned he had to come back and believe because he wasn't in the father's graces while he was away but then he had to come back to the father and now he was in the kingdom and now he was saved it's this pentecostal you're lost you're saved you're lost you're saved you're lost you're saved no right the bible says he had two sons so whether the son was gone, or the son was here, or the son was there, or anywhere, he was a son. Okay? So this is a picture of the saved, I believe. This is a picture of a saved, backslidden believer. He had two sons. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Once a son, you're always a son. Right? And verse 12 says, And the younger of them said to his father, 
Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. So the younger here asks for one third of all of what the father has. I've heard it said, Lord, um, many times that he essentially has said to his father, because this was supposed to be the inheritance that happened after he died. He says, Father, give me what is owed me if you were to die today. Father, I wish you were dead so that I could have one third of the wealth. Because we know in Israel there was a double portion given unto the oldest son. And so two sons would have three portions. Two would go to the older and one would go to the younger, right? So he's asking for one third of everything. He's not dead, though. He divided his living unto him. So the father does as is asked of him, despite the insult and despite the offense that should have come upon him, could have. And in verse 13 it says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. So why did he ask for this wealth? Why did he ask for it all to be given to him? Well, so that he could gather it and go and just waste it. With riotous living, the Bible says here. We see that it was spent. He wasted it all. And you know what? Sin is always a waste. When we get out of the Father's will, when we step out of His kingdom, His protection, His plan, His desires for us, sin's always a waste. And this is what He exhibited to us. He, he took what was rightfully His, which is the inheritance of all things, here by type one-third, of course, but He took the inheritance of the Father and went and just wasted it. Even so do we when we are born again, and we just waste all of the eternal life that is given to us. We waste the opportunity. We waste the, 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 the potential that we have to do great works for the Father. And then we step off and instead just do our own thing. Riotous living. A violent disturbance of the peace is what a riot is. Often there's a crowd associated. He got with the wrong crowd. Riotously lived his life. Wasted it all. Verse 14, it says, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in that want. Isn't it amazing how the famine, that lack, that emptiness just comes in on the heels of the son that had left the father's will? And God will do that to you. This is how he will draw us back. We talk about it all the time, that, that God dealeth with sons with chastening. So you get outside of his will. You can kind of do things your own way for a little while. You get by, you're enjoying yourself. This is great not going to church. This is great doing my own thing. This is great having my own, my own life. I'm free from the Father's will. And the next thing you know, you check your pockets, you got nothing left. You look around you and there's famine and dearth and waste. Nothing but that around you. Verse 15, it continues to say, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. So he didn't join himself to a citizen of his own country. Right? We are of heavenly Jerusalem. The right thing to do would have been to join himself to one of his own people, one of God's people, one of his own nation. Instead, he goes and is after that country and seeks help from them. He's unequally yoked now. Things got worse. He's, he's leaning on the world to help him in his time of need. Goes to a citizen of that country, unequally yokes with him. And next thing you know, he is in the fields feeding swine. Now, many know that the swine was an Old Testament unclean animal. Israel didn't have much business with those things. They were unclean. They didn't eat them. They didn't use them. They didn't touch them. They didn't have them. They didn't keep them. So it would have been the lowest of lows for this to go and work in this condition. Verse 16 says, And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Isn't it interesting that he wasted his substance with riotous living? I suspect that he had many friends. I expect that, that there was lots of buddies, you know, because a riot has that connotation of a group of people. When he had all the money, there was lots of people there to be with him and to rejoice with him and to take from him. And now he has nothing left, and there's no man left to give unto him. There's no one that was his buddy before when he had all the money to be there to spend time with him help him out. He had to go join himself to a stranger and work in the fields and slop with the pigs and eat the slop with the pigs. He ate among the swine. He ate among the unclean, fain to have filled his belly with, with the refuse of the leader, with the refuse of his boss. Here he's at the lowest of the low. 
It's not even that he's eating swine, which is unclean in of itself, but he's actually eating with the swine, the same thing as the swine, while he served them. It shows that he was even underneath the beast, that he was, that he was uh, you know, like, he, he served the swine and just ate what they left over. It's low. Things are bad. And this is, this is the thing, like, it, it's serious business when God chastens his own, Right? Now, anyone then could tell if, if they were a citizen of Israel, of his own nation, of his own country, they would look on him, and we do the same when we look at this, this story. We say, look, he, he is wrong. He's in sin. That's unclean. You shouldn't do that. You should do this instead. I can't believe you, right? We would have all sorts of criticism for a guy like this. He'd, he'd gotten away from the will of God. He's gotten out of the, the proper fellowship. He's left the Father's will. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Rather, he's wasted his life. His Christian walk is a mess. His testimony's drug through the mud. He's literally in the slop. We would all have all sorts of criticism for someone like that. And someone in Israel would definitely do the same. That's an unclean beast. What are you going to eat with that thing? It wouldn't have changed the thing, though. I'm sure he'd heard it time and time and time again. I'm sure his own heart and mind and conscience of what he was taught when he was with his father had, had weighed on him, and he knew. And so hearing it from some other person wouldn't have changed anything. Sometimes people need to get out there, think they're living it up, whooping it up, going through a ride, having a great time, hit rock bottom where they're eating slop, right? And sometimes people got to go through that on their own. No matter what you tell them, they're not going to be convinced of anything until, until they get there. So sometimes the best thing we can do for Christians is just pray for them while they're going through that. Exhort them, encourage them, say, hey man, I could tell you that, that, that drinking and partying is not God's will for you, but you probably know that. How about it? And that's what, this, that's what the Father did. He didn't argue with them. He didn't debate with them. He didn't say, you know, that's not right. He said... Your heart's set to go and live the way you want to live outside of my will. He said, have at it. And then he prayed for him. I believe he prayed for him. Some people need to figure these things out on your own. We find that in verse 17. It says, and when he came to himself, right? Someone going to him really wouldn't have helped. Some people like this have to go through it. They have to be literally on their belly, trying to fill their belly with swine's refuse to come to themselves. And he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He said, I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. So he prepared himself. He looked in the mirror and he said, and he said, what have I done? What have I become? Look at me. I came to himself. He had a conversation with himself and began his journey home. He realized he was wrong. He realized he needed repentance. The angels are rejoicing. And he starts his way back, and he's preparing the apology for his father. He's preparing to beg for forgiveness. Make me as a serf in your kingdom. Make me as the lowest of low. I have done wrong. I have done wickedly. You see a truly contrite and broken spirit here, a heart that is really just grieving in repentance. Here the son comes back, and the Bible says, but when the, he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. He didn't scold him. He didn't turn from him. He didn't slam the door. He didn't beat up on him and mock him and ridicule him and say, I told you you should have known. Didn't I raise you right? What is wrong with you? To the contrary, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The compassion and a kiss as the angels are rejoicing in heaven over the repentance that had taken place. As, this, as the sinner returns to the Father. He's done with his riot. He's done with his party. He's done with his foolishness and wickedness. He wants his Father to lift him up and even make him one of the lowliest in his kingdom. Give me a small little duty to do in your kingdom and in your will. 
He rehearsed the apology for which there was no need to give. He prepared words to his father and said, I'm going to say this to him, I'm going to say that to him, I'm going to do this to him. Surely he did not expect to find a praying father who had already forgiven him. And this is God in our life. Realize God's already forgiven us for every sin and transgression that we have. And yet we're so, we're so often holding on to repenting and turning to him and asking for forgiveness when all we have to do is literally go from, I am a mess, I can't believe I, Lord, would you, and the hug and kiss is on you. He sees your heart. He's ready. He's ready and willing to forgive. He's already forgiven you. No need for the rehearsed apology. No need for theatrics. No need for the preparation that goes before it. Just a broken and contrite spirit. The Bible says, Thou shalt not despise of our God, of our Father. The Bible says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a catch here, though. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. In dealing with our brethren and seeing one, as the Father did, afar off and, 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 and outside of his will, and certainly he was angry and there might have been mixed emotions over it, in regard to the son that had took off, he needed to forgive him. Unto 70 times 7, the Bible says. And we ought to do the same for wayfaring brethren. When you see people going down the wrong path, when you see people making bonehead decisions, they're outside of the will of God. They get away with it for a little bit, it seems, but it's not long before God will drag them through the muck. We need to be as the Father and prepare to forgive as soon as they return, the moment they return. Amen. Ephesians 4, verse 32 says, Be ye kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Amen. Kindness, tender-heartedness, forgiveness, even as God has. Look at it. He just, he turned to his father. He had, he had prepared this great apology, and from a distance the father saw him, had already forgiven him, and came to him with a hug and with an embrace. We don't always need, Christian, you don't always need an apology. You don't always need to expect an apology. People do you wrong. People hurt you. People turn from the ways of God. They get backslidden. It does hurt us, but we don't always need an apology. We shouldn't expect it. The thing we got to realize about a lot of people is they'll go off. They'll get into sin. They'll do you wrong. Them turning back, preparing their hearts as they come towards you, even maybe they're thinking about what they are going to say in the apology. Sometimes just coming back is hard enough for most people. So when they do, we need to meet them with forgiveness. We need to meet them as the Father did. Verse 22 of the Bible records the testimony of the Son. But the Father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes upon his feet. What is that on the heels of? That's on the heels of... He came and kissed him. The son still manages to get the uh, uh, ask for forgiveness out. He says, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I am no more worthy to be called my son. The father says, it is enough. Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Your father doesn't bring you back into the fold and make you a serf. God brings you right back to where you were in the beginning when you messed up. I love that. There will be another decision to make of the same regard, but you find it time and time again. Look at the case of Jonah. Hey, Jonah, I have, will, I have a will for you. I desire you to go and preach. And Jonah, with that bad, snobby attitude, was like, no, nope, I'm not doing it. I don't want to see those awful Ninevites saved. I'm out of here. And he goes in the opposite direction. Next thing you know, he's in a pig pen. He's in a whale. Spit up on the dirt, right? And next thing you know, he's back at that same spot. The same decision, the same command, the same father saying, okay, now go and preach, right? So here the father brings him back. He hugs him. He loves on him. He brings forth the robe. He puts it on him. He puts the ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. It says, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead 
and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. When we're Christians and we're backslidden, we have dead faith. When you come back to the fold, when you come back to the labor and the work of God, you're alive, alive, alive forevermore. Right back to where God had you in the first place. He puts that ring on your finger. He puts that, that, that uh, robe on you. He gets the fatty cap. He celebrates, rejoicing in heaven over that one sinner that repented. Because he was dead and is alive. Because he was lost and is he found. Now is the time to make merry and to rejoice. It says in verse 25, Now his son, his elder son, was in the field. So he looks at from afar off. He sees what's going on. He hears what's going on. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come. Thy father hath killed the fatty calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Now don't be like the brother here. He should be rejoicing, but instead what do we find? Verse 28. He was angry and would not go in. The response of the brother who had in this deal received twice as much as was wasted. He'd received the whole of the substance because the father took everything he had, divided it up in three, gave two parts to the elder and one to... So the father essentially at that point owned none of it. It was all on the eldest son. And what was wasted was gone, of course. So he owned all of the living, all of the substance. He had it all. And when the brother comes back, he doesn't meet him as his father did with rejoicing. And really, his father should be the one that's hurt. Right? The father should be the one, we would think, exhibiting the, the, I'm angry with you. You wasted everything, all of my work, all of my labor. I trusted it to you, and you just treat me like that? You go and riot and waste it all? That should have been the attitude of the father. And yet the father received him with mercy, compassion, fell on him, and kissed him. And the son, who, the elder brother, who had... Nothing lost from it. He had everything he was expected to receive, besides to be angry with the brother. And it says, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. The anger and resentment was so much so he didn't even want to return to the house. So the father comes to him. Verse 29, he answering said unto his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgress thy at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. This brother, he always did right. He was always consistent. He was without transgression. He said, surely I'm worthy of this reward and much more. I've always been here. I've always been working for you. I've always been in your will. I've always done that which is right. Why aren't you killing fatted calves and letting me celebrate with my friends? But he missed the idea. And the point was that he had already had it all. Yeah, you did right. Yeah, you were consistent. Yeah, you were without transgression. But you don't remember when I gave you everything that I had? I divided unto you my living. Go to verse 30, it's key. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And we're starting to see uh, two different reactions that take place here. Either we, were, we welcome brethren that sin against us with open arms and an embrace when they repent, or we get angry and we say, you know, why should we welcome him back? Why should we love them? Don't you know what they've been doing this last little while? They've been wasting. And here he says, you're living with harlots. And what evidence did he have? If he was always in the Father's will, he was always at the farm. If he was always consistent, doing right, without transgression, how did he know that the substance was wasted with harlots? He did. And yet he presumed... That, that was the case. He exaggerated by his imagination. Where the Bible says it was riotous living, 
He puts in harlots. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. What are we seeing here? When we watch a brethren that has sinned against us, when we watch somebody making the wrong decision, running away into sin, we don't know everything. We, we don't know what they were up to. We don't know what they've wasted. We don't know how far they've sinned. We don't know anything. We don't know what other people are going through. And because we don't know, we shouldn't be like the brother and just assume the worst. We shouldn't just assume that, that you know, we don't see somebody in church and, oh, well, they must be just like a drunk. They must be just partying. They must be just, when well, we have no evidence of it. We, we don't see somebody come and soul winning as often or something. We don't just assume that, oh, man, they're, they're, they've lost their faith. I bet you they're not even reading the Bible. I bet you they, we, we can't just put that on them. We, we, we can't, as the brother did, when the Bible says that he was wasting his substance with riotous living, the brother says, harlots. He's spending all the money on harlots. He exaggerated, and because of his own imagination, because of his own heart, that was not right with God, with the Father. He wasn't in tune with the Father's heart. The Father's heart was praying for that to come back and ready to forgive him as soon as he sees him on the horizon. As soon as he sees the top of the crown of his head come over back to the farm. The father ran out and embraced him. Right? He, the, the older brother was not in tune with that heart. Rather, he was envious now of the mercy that was bestowed upon the other son. When he saw mercy extended to that sinner, right, that showed repentance, when he saw mercy extended to him, it, it made him mad. And that's the Jonah attitude. Go look at Jonah chapter 4. He says, God, I didn't want to preach to Nineveh because I knew you were merciful. <laughs> I didn't want to tell them the truth because I knew you'd forgive them. And with that bad, sour attitude, Jonah lived out the rest of that book, unfortunately. He was envious of that small little gift that was given him after forgiveness and after the long-suffering, after the prayers, no doubt, the father had already given. He was envious, the older brother was, of that little gift of a fatted calf and did not realize that he had and was entitled to and had already felt and received blessing upon blessing upon blessing all that time that the brother was away. He was envious of the small gift and missed out on the fact that there was years of blessings that he was able to receive and enjoy. Now, I myself can be hypercritical of those missing church and those skipping church and those closing church and just be spending all of my days just, just obsessed with that. What in the world? Why are all these churches in Canada closed? Why are all these churches in the States closed? I can be obsessed with that and let that create in me a bitter heart and miss out on the fact that I'm in church right now. I've got blessings abound. I've got everything that the Father has for me. I can celebrate and rejoice with my friend. That's what the brother had. He had all of these things, and yet he wanted to pick on those out there that didn't have what he had. And then when they came back into the fold, he wanted to get angry about them being accepted back in. And I can do the same thing. I can go and get bitter at the people so that once these church op churches open and once these churches pack out, because you're going to see just an influx if this thing opens up of just religiosity. You know, you're going to find the church that, that before was running 20 is now like running 60. Because everyone's just like, woo, the gates are open, we're back in, woo. The church that whittled it down to 10 and they're doing a lottery to see who's allowed to come and who's not allowed to come, right? The doors are going to open, there's going to be 350 people there that first Sunday. Fatted calf is killed. Everyone's rejoicing. One sinner repented. <laughs> and I can get bitter on that. And I can be like, Father, how are you going to bless those preachers that closed the door and then opened it up. When I was here all the while, doing all of your will, holding all of the services, and what I'm missing is the fact that I was here in the house of God, receiving, giving, hearing, singing, enjoying everything that the Father has for me. Well, they were not. Mm -hmm. They were wasting it. They were wasting the opportunity that they had. All of this while to be in the house of God, to be at the farm, to be in his will, 
I can certainly get bitter like that brother. Father, these many weeks I have been serving thee, and now, Father, you're blessing them. Now that they've returned unto your service, now that they've returned and asked forgiveness, now you're going to just fill their churches of plenty. Now you're going to kill for them the fatted calf. Now there's going to be this great rejoicing. What about me? But look what the Father's going to say to me if I have that attitude. And he said unto him, verse 31, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meat. It was needful. It was, it was demanded. It was required that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. So, when our brethren out there return to the service, return to the commandments of the Father, I got to learn to rejoice. I got to be happy with it. I got to have that right attitude when people that have, I believe, made the wrong decisions come back into doing what is right. Amen. Otherwise, I'm carrying the attitude of the Son, not the Father. I need to rejoice in and appreciate the fact not only do we now have a two-thirds portion of what was allotted to us because the Father dished it out right away, but now essentially because it was all wasted because of the measure of the Spirit, because of the blessings that were abound, the, uh, the potential of what could have happened if people were gathering together in church was all wasted, it's gone. Now, because we decided to stay in the Father's will, we have it all. We have everything that all of them out there are missing today. I need to rejoice and appreciate that. I need to, above all of this, not forget, you know, take heed, you know, think as he stands, lest he falls. I need not forget that I am just one dumb decision away from a snowballing effect of my own life being sent to slop and uncleanness. All of us are certainly capable of being that son. And if we look at that story and look at the two reactions, I think we can definitely see where God wants us to be. Be mindful of the fact that while they are missing and they are wasting and they are living riotously, I can't suppose to presume I know what they're all up to. I also need to be mindful of the fact that if I was in the place of the older brother, that I'm here in the Father's will and I have everything that comes with that. I have it all. Son, thou art ever with me. And Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we were ever with the Father, were we not? And all that I have is thine. But then we need to remember it was me for us. It's suitable. It's proper. It's in order that when they decide to come to themselves and realize the mistake and turn to the Father and return to his fold and his will, we need to rejoice with the Father because he's already ready to forgive them. And if we're not ready to forgive our brother his trespasses, neither will our father forgive us our trespasses. And we find ourselves in the rut that the brother has. And while he always had access to the father's will and the, and the, and the, the farmhouse and everything that was the father's, he shut himself out of it. Why did he shut himself out of it? Because he was angry and would not go in. Because that one was forgiven that one was forgiven, and that one was forgiven, and now they're receiving blessings abound. Well, you nimkapoop, Josh, you had those blessings all the time. You had that church assembly all the time. The, the danger was kept at bay. No one bothered us all that time, right? Rejoice when our brethren return to the service and to the commandment of the Father as one that was dead and is alive again. Rejoice and appreciate the fact that we have all that the Father has provided for us. And they missed out on something great. They did. These last few weeks have been awesome, spiritually speaking. I'm seeing the Bible alive more than ever. But if I lose track of that because I'm going to be bitter with them, then I'm missing out on extreme blessings. And don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. We are all just 
one dumb decision away from a steamrolling effect that puts us in the same position as our brethren that we're judging and even exaggerating what they might be into by our own imaginations. Forgive others as your father forgives. That's the moral of the story. As the father forgave, as even the thought of turning back to him come across the mind of the sinner, God was ready there to just fall upon them with compassion. And when he fell on them with compassion and kissed them, he didn't make them start at the bottom and build their way up. No, 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 no. He put that same robe on their shoulders. He put that same ring on their hand. He put shoes on their feet, cleaned them up, brought them right back to the position that they were at. You know, the church of 300, they're right there. But then he slayed the fatted calf. So they're going to get some extra. Things are going to be really good for them. You can't be bitter about it. <laughs> and I'm thankful for everyone here that is doing right, consistently, without transgression. I'm thankful that God's given me the grace to be consistently doing right and without transgression in the area of the local congregation. I'm so thankful for that. That he's been gracious with me and long-suffering, patient with me, and, and has given me the, the opportunity, the hedge of protection round about me. But I need to watch my attitude in all this. And not end up like the brother. Rather end up like the father. That when they return, I can rejoice with them. Right? I think that's great, and that's good.